in the hope that, you know, it would distract him from the time and he'd be late so like his boss would have already have left and he couldn't have gone to work. So he went to work. And I told him, look, if you go to work you're gonna you're going to die. And he kissed me and he left for work. I this was at the doorstep. Um literally the next thing that I remember was I was on the floor of my dining room and I have absolutely no recollection how I'd got there, what the thought process was behind it. It was as if I had just woken up and I was sat on the floor and I was surrounded by boxes of his stuff. And as I woke up, I was putting one of his trophies, he was a Welsh schoolboy amateur Welsh champion boxing, boxer. And as I woke up, I was putting one of his trophies into um, one of the boxes. And I realized I was packing his stuff and it was all his stuff, it was none of mine. And so I thought to myself, right, okay, I'm not gonna think about it. I'm just gonna go and have a bath, try to calm down, try to relax and, you know, not think about it. So my mum comes over that day and I tell her and she was trying to keep me calm and occupied, I guess. I was on pens all day, but at about five o'clock, he walks in completely fine and in one piece and alive. So I was so like, I was, I was just thinking, oh, you know, like, so I was happy, obviously. And I was waiting for this relief to come which didn't. So he took my mum home and he had dressed up because we were going out that night for Valentine's. It was late Valentine's but and he wasn't one to get dressed up in a shirt and things like that but he did. He, he made the effort and he took my mum home and he went into the house and had a conversation which I'll get into in a bit but I was starting to panic again because he was taking his sweet ass time and I was timing him like this. I mean, it shouldn't have taken half the time that it did for him. So I was panicking. But he walked back into the house, safe in one piece and alive. Again, I waited for that relief, <laughs> that feeling of relief to come, and it didn't. So I tried to put it out of my mind and we went out and we ate and we got drunk and had a really good night. But our conversation was, totally different. It wasn't the usual, you know, light-hearted, funny, stupid conversation of two drunken kids. He started talking about marriage and he asked me, what would you say if I asked you to marry me? And I thought about it and obviously I wanted to, I wanted to get married and I would have said yes, obviously, but I, I said, that, you know, there's no rush for that. I want to marry you, but, you know, I'm not in any rush. We were very young. So that was that conversation. What I didn't realize was that he had actually gone into my parents' house to speak to my dad, to, to ask him his permission to ask me to marry him. And he was actually trying to put the feels out and see what my reaction was and was trying to ask me to marry him. So the conversation moved on and I said to him, I know you think I'm crazy, but I have this feeling and I am convinced that you're going that you are going to die. And he was like, nothing is gonna happen to me. I'm not going anywhere. It's just your imagination. You know all the things that people say. 15 minutes later, he was fighting for his life. We had come home in a taxi and there's a kind of footpath that leads up to our house. I had grabbed hold of his hand the second we got out of the taxi. I, I just, this feeling was just getting worse and worse. We had to walk up, we got like um, a sort of a veranda, I think it's called, I'm not sure. It's like a, a footpath, it's basically like a footpath that runs alongside all of the houses in my street and in front of the houses is a wall that's between three and five feet depending on what part of the wall it is. Beyond the wall is a grass banking that slopes down to another little wall and a sheer drop 
which is 25 feet down to the road below. So as I said, I had grabbed hold of his hand when we got out of the taxi and we were walking up the footpath up to our house. We live about halfway up. He let go of my hand and he ran on ahead. By the time I looked up, I couldn't see him anymore. So I was laughing because I knew he'd jumped over the wall and I carried on walking up to the house just you know, I knew he was going to jump out on me and he was hiding behind the wall and, and all that. It wasn't the first time that he's done it, so... I'd gotten to the house and there wasn't any sign of him, so I was starting to get a little bit concerned. I had heard something. He cried out, um, but it, it literally only sounded as if... I thought he'd been stung by nettles or, you know, he got scratched by a bush or something and that was when I was walking up to the house. So I started to get a bit concerned and I thought, you know, this is, this is stupid. I'm already up the house, just jump out already. And I looked over the wall and there was nothing. He, he was no longer there. There wasn't anywhere for him to have gone without me knowing, without me seeing, except for down. So I knew. I started screaming and my neighbors came to their windows Luckily two of them were nurses, which it made me feel a little better. They couldn't do anything, but it made me feel a little better. I'm not going to go into too much detail about what actually... He had basically fallen 25 feet onto his head and shoulders, and I ran down and I found him lying there, gargling on his own blood and bleeding from his left ear. That an ambulance was called, obviously, and the police were called, and they have me on record hysterically screaming. I knew it was gonna happen, I knew it was gonna happen. Uh, he basically had brain damage, he did survive. Well, somebody survived, <laughs> not the person that he was. So, that is the story of my premonition, the man that I loved did actually die that night um, because he wasn't the same person when he woke up. Um, that was in 2003, so that was like 13 years ago already, it's crazy. Um, yeah, okay, bye guys.